Hello and welcome to Politics at Jack and Sam's Daily. And because you want another first, yes, it's our first daily episode on a Saturday. My name is Jack Blanchard from Politico. With me, as always, is a very tired looking Sam Coates after, God, that must have been a marathon sprint for you on Sky News, Sam, yesterday. How many hours were you on air yesterday? <laughs> well, I started at 7am and we finished at 10 uh, somewhere between uh, the studio, about eight hours in the studio, and then about four hours uh, in the street uh, as the new members of the cabinet were walking up Downing Street to be appointed for the first ever... Well, it wasn't a reshuffle because, you know, it was his first cabinet and there was very little shuffle in it after uh, it, it turned out. As I was sort of flagging around tea time, having had about two hours sleep uh, the, the night before and like we've got all these different stories we need to get out on Politico and we've got a live blog going, I was very much perked up by your sprightly voice he bellowing at each minister into Downing Street as they wandered into the door. Did they let you closer than normal? You seem to be sort of able to actually accost the new cabinet as they uh, as they came in. They, they didn't seem to have you penned in, which would have been surely a wiser thing to do with Sam Coates. One of the secrets of of big reshuffles like election day is a team go incredibly early a couple of days in advance and literally bag a spot like they're in the queue at Wimbledon. That's so funny. So it's sort of sort of like German holiday makers with their towels on the on the uh, on the seats around the pool. Except you wouldn't want to be around the pool in that weather. I can tell you <laughs> it was sodden and Everything I own, including all my clothes, are soaked through right this morning. Thoughts and prayers for Sam Coates' wardrobe. Right, well, we're not going to make a habit of doing Saturday morning podcast, but there is so much happening right now that we thought we'd treat you with one extra one, and we're going to try and tee up the day ahead because it is an extremely busy day in politics. We are going to have the first Labour cabinet meeting this morning in 14 years. That should be kicking off at about 10 o'clock in the morning and Keir Starmer is going to be giving a press conference after that so we're going to hear a lot about our new government today and we're going to talk about what that is going to look like on the shape of that new government we're going to get a raft of new junior ministerial appointments today so we'll talk through what we can be expecting there and generally what we can expect from the Labour Party over the next few days and we're going to talk about the Tories of course and the meltdown and where do they go from here and what we can expect to happen in what is certain to become a Tory leadership contest test immediately and how that's likely to pan out over the weekend. Um, let's start with the cabinet, Sam, given you've, uh, you've already been shouting at them in the street. Um, we, we now have a full cabinet in place. We should see images this morning of Keir Starmer sitting around that famous table with his, uh, with his motley crew around him. And then we're going to get more of the junior ministerial appointments, the ones that you and I are always really interested in. Perhaps the nation is not clinging on desperately to see who is the new minister for paperclips but it is always interesting for us to see who's up and who's down in the Labour Party. There are definitely jitters amongst uh, some of the junior ranks of the, the Labour MPs as to whether they're actually going to get the uh, ministerial jobs that they've been shadowing. Uh, there are too many Labour <laughs> shadow ministers to actually get all the jobs so it's unlikely they will but I think they were reassured that there were few surprises uh, in the cabinet that was appointed yesterday. Most of the people who've been in those shadow departments got the jobs jobs that they were expecting and I think that has reassured Labour MPs that there are less likely to be any big surprises today and that the jobs that they've been doing in opposition most of them will end up doing in government and I think that's likely how it's going to have play out. If you look at the president of the cabinet there were really only two changes that we spotted. The first was to basically save Lisa Nandy. Um, it's not clear whether international development will be restored to being a, a, a Department of State. It feels at this stage like it wasn't because there isn't an international development secretary. But that was the position in opposition that was held by Lisa Nandy. She has been shuffled across to the culture secretary role. Um, there had been lots of rumours that she might face the axe. There were points at which it seemed that Team Starmer were not her biggest fan. She, of course, stood against him for the leadership. But she uh, but she ended up with a place. Without a place, it seems, is uh, Emily Thornbury. Uh, Keir Starmer appointed a different attorney general. So one of the most notable faces until recently of the Labour campaign has disappeared. Um, Emily Thornbury actually hadn't been appearing that much on the morning round. I think when we pointed this out, uh, she asked to be on more and was subsequently put on the next morning. But it doesn't appear like uh, there was a, a, a huge amount of love lost there. So she seems to have disappeared. Let's see whether she gets a job. But, but overall, I think the message of the reshuffle for me was it was quite cautious. 
I don't think Keir Starmer likes conflict. And so the so clearly on day one, his reshuffle avoided almost any conflict at all. So I wonder whether that's a tone that we're going to see uh, repeated over and over again. It's certainly a trait that some people in his now cabinet think that he has. The Emily Thornberry decision is fascinating. I think less so that Emily Thornberry is out. But have a look at the new Attorney General, Richard Harmer. He's a human rights lawyer from Matrix Chambers. He's a very interesting figure. He's spoken at Labour conferences. He's been advising Labour on Israeli matters. And of course, as the Attorney General of the government now, this is the guy that is going to be talking to the government about things like, is Israel breaking international law in Gaza? And therefore, what are the implications of that? And do we keep supplying them with weapons and so on? He is going to be a pivotal figure. And he is very interesting on some of this stuff. I'm not going to say any more than that. One other consequence of Emily Thornberry's decision, and this is one for long, long time Labour watches, is that one of the people helping her was our old friend Damien McBride. Now, I don't think Actually, anybody expected Damien McBride to, McBride to go into government had Emily Thornberry gone into government. But it's an, it, it is interesting that perhaps he remains uh, at the same distance from the government that he did yesterday. And we will see how that plays out. Or does he get a shiny new job in Downing Street? I wonder. Let's wait and see for that. And that's the other thing we're going to be fighting. We'll be trickling out over the weekend. What exactly are the jobs being handed out in Downing Street? What is going to be people like Sue Gray, people like Morgan McSweeney? What are their official job titles? That is going to emerge over the next 24, 48 hours. Those sort of big hitters. I mean, I think we sort of know roughly what we're expecting. But once we start to see a formal list of the number 10 machine... That will be very interesting for people like you and I who watch this stuff very closely. Also, whether or not there are big foreign policy political advisers, big domestic policy political advisers. I was talking to somebody uh, on the fringes of the conversation about all of this who weren't quite clear who the experts were in Keir Starmer's ear, even last week. There is some confusion about who his principal advisers on the biggest issues actually are, which which felt bewildering to me. You know, there's bits of advice here and bits of advice there on things like foreign affairs. But when you consider that Gordon Brown, Tony Blair and David Cameron and, and the rest, a lot of them had big hitting political experts to, to navigate, help navigate them through this stuff. It's not clear that Keir Starmer does, which was confusing some of the people I was talking to. What well, One of the places you might look for that, Sam, is actually in the House of Lords and in the junior ministerial ranks there. And we had two absolutely fascinating appointments late last night into the House of Lords and straight into the ranks of government. Sir Patrick Valance, we'll all remember him from the COVID days, was uh, appointed to the Lords last night and instantly made a Minister of State for Science in Keir Starmer's government. Raya, you have it. There is a man who is very clearly going to be advising Keir Starmer very closely on scientific matters as well as working in the government. And a second one, for you. James Timpson uh, made prisons minister. This is the guy that's been running the Timpson's empire and of course they have this wonderful record of helping people who have been in prison to then go and work back in business again. And speaking to someone who works in the prison sector last night, prisons of course are something that are on their knees. Possibly the biggest, most immediate crisis facing this government. Here's someone who really knows what they're talking about and this person I was speaking to was so excited by that appointment. They were just like, we'll talk about a sea change from where we've been before they were very very encouraged like that so straight away you got a couple of big voices there working in the ministerial ranks who really know their onions and it's possible we'll see more of those sorts of appointments today or over the weekend two more things to watch for one tory who was in touch with me said brace for another ministerial appointment that could raise eyebrows do you remember a certain person backing the labor campaign Boris Johnson's ex-wife, Marina Wheeler. No way. One Tory got in touch with me and said, you know, we think she could end up a minister. (laughs) So let's see whether that is uh, Tory speculation or whether that comes true. One more, Sam, for the geeks among us as we're talking junior ministers. The other thing that we need to keep an eye on is will there be early jobs for some of Keir Starmer's closest acolytes who were parachuted into safe seats on Thursday? People like Josh Simons, who was running the Labour Together think tank. People like Torsten Bell, who uh, used to work for Gordon Brown and who's running the Resolution Foundation think tank. People like Chris Ward, who is uh, Keir Starmer's Deputy Chief of Staff back in the day. These are people who are very close to this operation, who were handed out safe seats right at the the start of the election they are now mps 
Will they be brought straight into government in junior roles or will they be given maybe six or 12 months uh, to sort of find their feet as MPs before that happens? We don't know. But <laughs> these are guys that have not come in to Parliament to sit as backbench MPs. I can tell you that. So it is only a matter of time before that happens. And maybe it could happen as soon as today. Let's see. And uh, Douglas Alexander, of course, ex-Cabinet Minister, ran the 2015 Labour campaign. He's back. He probably doesn't think he needs to sit on the sidelines uh, for too long. One other thing to watch for, now, you might remember that our ambassador to Washington, Karen Pierce, basically was told she was coming back to London and uh, moving on to her next job. And we had thought that the person in line for that was Tim Barrow, who's National Security Advisor. But there's been some skullduggery in Whitehall, and it sounds as if Tim Barrow may now not give that get that job. Opening the way, if Keir Starmer wants to, to put a political appointee as our person to Washington. And that's how you've got to these rumours that, oh God, the whole election campaign is a fever dream. I can't even remember whether we've discussed it, but some people have been discussing about whether or not you could end up with Peter Mandelson or David Miliband as our person to Washington. But either way, with the, synth- with the size of majority, we could get somebody political in that key job. Whether or not David Lammy would really want... David Miliband in that job, I, I, you know, I, I think it's open to speculation uh, whether or not they'd want Peter Mandelson in that job, open to speculation. But that's there and that's another plum roll to be handed out. And which takes us neatly on to Keir Starmer's other big job of today and the weekend, which is having lots and lots of quick phone calls with lots and lots of foreign leaders, all of whom he needs to talk to and who need to congratulate him and they need to have a formal chat. I imagine this is sort of like diplomatic speed dating. Starmer can't really have time to have sort of 30 really useful conversations with all these people who are running the world. But this is a whole formality to this thing and you have to do it in the right order. He's already spoken to Joe Biden. He's already spoken to Emmanuel Macron. He's already spoken to the Irish teacher. And and, and, and there will be more and more of that today as well. I can't imagine how useful these calls are. They're probably really weird and awkward, but nevertheless, that is certainly going to occupy a fair bit of his weekend. Um, should we talk about this press conference that's coming up, Sam? Keir Starmer is going to address the nation, hopefully take a load of questions from uh, from Her Majesty's Press as well. Um, and the plan for that, clearly, is for him to get on the front foot. This is a, a Prime Minister who needs to immediately show that he's got a plan action is going to be taken you can't just be seen to be twiddling thumbs and dawdling uh, in number 10 and who knows maybe he's got some big bazooka policy up his sleeve that he hasn't been telling us about that is exactly what the uh, Labour did in 97 as we've said before they were in power for about two days before Gordon Brown announced suddenly he was going to make the Bank of England independent there had not been a whisper of that before they were into power so it's possible that Labour have something big up their sleeves Um, Given we don't know whether that's true or not, let's talk about the things that we do know. We know they want to go big on housing quickly. We're expecting uh, movement on planning very, very quickly. A planning reform, of course, is free. So that's a reform you can do that doesn't require loads and loads of money, which, of course, we know the government doesn't have. So we can expect them to go very quickly with that. Um, We're going to cancel the Rwanda scheme immediately. That's 250 million quid up the Swanee from Rishi Sunak. and, uh, and, And Rwanda will pocket that and that will be the end of that they can sort of think of that as a down payment on the foreign aid budget that Rishi Sunak enjoyed cutting so much um and junior doctors is the other thing I think that is top of the list, right? Sam Westreeting, the new health secretary, was talking about that immediately last night, and he's going to have talks with the doctors next week. They, of course, were on strike uh, right the way up to the election, and they will be looking. Labour will be looking for a win there quickly but they won't want to be seen as caving in because that will immediately pose a difficult narrative for them in the right-wing press. Um, And that's definitely not where West Streeting is at as a politician. But equally, they want to be seen to be coming in and fixing things. Then this is one of the first big things that needs fixing. They have already been warned that if they give too much to the junior doctors, there'll be contagion and demands from other unions. Should we talk about the Tories very quickly? Because we've already been going quite a lot of minutes a rump is left. We've been doing some analysis about what this rump looks like. And there are 121 Tory MPs left, and they've got to determine the future of the party. Um, We've been doing some analysis about who they are. And of the approximately 90 that we can determine their voting patterns, um, it seems like about 30 back Liz Truss for the leadership at the last campaign, during that campaign, whereas the rest 
backed one of the other candidates, arguably one of the other more moderate candidates. So about 30 Trussites out of the rump, as far as we can tell, which is, uh, which is, which is 90, um, which, is a, which is a big old minority, but it still is a minority. So the question then is, could the Tories end up steering themselves in a slightly more moderate direction? The big picture is that nobody has any idea what's about to, to happen next. Uh, although the party chair survived, the chief whip did not. There is a big old row about how long this contest should take, how long Rishi Sunak should stay in place. It's going to be pretty gruesome to watch him at Prime Minister's questions and exactly what sort of contest uh, and whether even it should uh, end up going to the membership. I think there are some uh, who think that William Hague's big reforms post-1997 were a bad idea. So there's a, a lot of looking in the mirror and before we get to the who uh, I think the how and the what are going to take up quite a lot of our time. I completely agree and just to give you a sense of how much trouble the Tories are in this is the first time the Tories have ever had fewer than 130 seats in the House of Commons in their history this is the first time ever that less than a quarter of the country voted Conservative this is the first time ever we've had Labour MPs in seats like Aldershot and Bury St Edmunds and the Isle of Wight um, this is a Tory party that has completely collapsed in key heartlands and as someone was pointing out yesterday even if you know they won back all the seats that reformers essentially cost them uh, on Thursday by splitting the vote that would still not be nearly enough for a majority they need to win back Lib Dem seats in their droves as well so somehow whoever takes over the Tory party has to appeal to all those reform voters they've lost and all those Liberal Democrat voters they've lost. Now, what is the message that you send to both of those sides that somehow brings the coalition back together from a, a rump that is the worst position your party's ever been in its history and somehow turn that around in five years and put yourself in a position to win an election? Good luck with that. A tricky task indeed. I have to say, it was quite notable. Rishi Sunak's one of his last big campaign stops, I know because I was there, uh, this week was in Banbury in Oxfordshire and, and, and sort of travelling around that whole area. There are now zero Tory MPs in what was true blue Oxfordshire. The heavens have opened as I'm speaking, so there is some celestial displeasure, it looks like, with the Tories at the moment. Very, very quickly, Sam, I'm expecting leadership bids from Suella Braverman, Kemi Badenoch, Priti Patel, Tom Duganat, Robert Jenrick as a starting point. Five of the people left standing who could well be in the mix for it. But as we say, that maybe they'll start tomorrow. Keep an eye on the Sunday shows. I expect some of them might be on the sofa and talking about what they think about the Tory party. And some of them may not. Two more things to say. Everything's going to stop at five o'clock today, of course, because it's the football. England are playing Switzerland in the Euros and Keir Starmer will not be making appointments or speeches during that. So I think you can expect politics to finish a little bit early today and and happy for that um i've got to plug two brilliant politico podcasts before we go my colleague sasha o'sullivan has made a diary of the election night she spent the whole evening running around the watch parties and the best counts and she has pulled together a sort of highlights reel of what happens so if you want to relive the night please do that and my other colleague Anne mckelvoy sits down with matt kaminsky and um jamil andalini two of our top editors to talk about what it all means for britain's place in the world so more listening for you if this wasn't enough this morning okay we will be back on monday morning uh, we're going to give ourselves a whole day off this weekend so i uh, look very much forward to seeing you then yeah and just to stress the podcast will keep going daily next week because there is still so much going on so yep see you then thanks very much <laughs>